Good afternoon everyone, Country Flyboy here, and today the second video in the Floatplane series. So in the last video we discussed airplane types, seaplane regulations, and in this video we will be focusing on a very important concept for flying a seaplane. And that is water and its characteristics. We are only discussing the parts concerning operating seaplanes in Flight Simulator, so again, if you want the full story, go read the book I recommend in the description, because not everything applicable, or not everything in that book applies to flying it in Flight Sim. A competent seaplane pilot is knowledgeable in the characteristics of water and how they affect the seaplane. As a fluid, water seeks its own level and forms a flat, glassy surface if undisturbed. Winds, currents, or objects traveling along its surface create waves and movements that change the surface characteristics. Just as airplanes encounter resistance in the form of drag as they move through the air, seaplane hulls and floats respond to the drag forces as they move through the water. Drag varies proportionally to the square of speed. In other words, doubling the speed across the water results in four times the amount of drag. Forces created when operating an airplane on water are more complex than those created on land. For land planes, friction acts at a specific point where the tires meet the ground. Water forces act along the entire length of the seaplane's float or hull. These forces vary constantly depending on the pitch attitude and changing motion of the float or hull, and the action the waves take. Because floats are mounted rigidly to the structure of the fuselage, they provide no shock absorbing functions unlike the landing gear of a land plane. While water may seem soft and yielding, damaging forces and shocks can be transmitted directly through the floats and struts to the basic structure of the airplane. Under calm wind conditions, the smooth water surface presents a uniform appearance from above, somewhat like a mirror. This situation eliminate the visual reference for the pilot and can be extremely deceptive. If the waves are decaying and setting up for certain patterns, or if clouds are reflected from the water surface, the resulting distortions can be confusing even for an experienced seaplane pilot. This is typically known as glassy water. The ability to read the water's surface is an integral part of seaplane flying. Interaction of wind and water to determine the surface conditions. While tides and currents affect the movement of water itself, muddy water starts here, and it's high tide. Here's the water at low tide. High tide water line, low tide water line. Total distance about 10 feet at this little boat launch. Features along the shore and under the water's surface contribute to their effects as well. With a little study, the interplay between these factors becomes clearer. Waves are usually caused by wind moving across the surface of the water. As the air pushes the water, ripples form. These ripples become waves in strong or sustained winds. The higher the speed of the wind, or the longer the wind acts upon them, the larger the waves. Waves can be caused by other factors, such as underwater earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, or tidal movement, but wind is the primary cause of most waves. Calm water begins to show wave motion when the wind reaches about two knots. At this wind speed, patches of ripples begin to form. If the wind stops, the surface tension and gravity quickly damp the waves and the surface returns to its flat, glassy condition. If the wind increases to four knots, the ripples become small waves which move in the same direction as the wind and persist for some time after the wind stops blowing. As wind speed increases above four knots, the water surface becomes covered with a complicated pattern of waves. When the wind is increasing, waves become larger and travel faster. If the wind remains at a constant speed, waves develop into a series of evenly spaced parallel crests of the same height. Unlike wind and current, waves are not deflected much by the rotation of the earth, but move in the direction in which the generating wind blows. When this wind ceases, water friction and spreading reduce the wave height, but the reduction takes place so slowly that a swell persists until the waves encounter an obstruction such as the shore. 
Swell systems from many different directions and even different parts of the world may cross each other and interact. Often, two or more swell systems are visible on the surface, with a sea wave system developing due to the current wind. In lakes and sheltered waters, it's often easy to tell the wind direction simply by looking at the water's surface. There's usually a strip of calm water along the upwind shore of a lake, waves are perpendicular to the wind direction, and wind speeds above approximately 8 knots leave wind streaks in the water which are parallel to the wind. Land masses sculpt and channel the air as it moves over them, changing wind direction and speed. Wind direction may change dramatically from one part of a lake or bay to another, and may even blow in opposite directions with surprisingly short distances. Always pay attention to the various wind indicators in the area, especially when setting up for takeoff and landing. Now, it's kind of pointless to explain these things as there's really only one sim that can even allow you to use this knowledge. However, I feel it's good to know how it's done in the real world. This allows you to know just how big a departure from reality even the best sims can be. It also allows you to replicate these procedures properly if you wish to, but know that you won't be able to replicate them to a T. Compared to operations from typical hard surface runways, taking off from and landing on water presents several added variables for the pilot to consider. Waves and swells not only create rough and uneven surface, they also move, and their movement must be considered in addition to the wind direction. Even relatively small waves and swells can complicate seaplane operations. Takeoffs on rough water can subject the floats to hard pounding as they strike consecutive wave crest. Operating on surface in rough conditions exposes the seaplane to forces that can potentially cause damage or in some cases overturn the seaplane. When a swell is not aligned with the wind, the pilot must weigh the dangers posed by the swell against the limited crosswind capability as well as the pilot's experience. On the other hand, calm, glassy water presents a different set of challenges. Since the wind is calm, taxiing and docking are somewhat easier, but takeoffs and landings require special technique. Takeoff distances may be longer because the wings get no extra lifting help from the wind, and the floats adhere more tenaciously to glassy water surfaces too. When landing, the flat featureless water makes it far more difficult to gauge the height accurately. And reflections can create confusing optical illusions. The specific techniques for glassy water operations are covered later. Tides are cause for concern when the airplane is beached or moored in shallow water. A rising tide can lift a beached seaplane and allow it to float out to sea if the airplane is not properly secured. Depending on the height of the tide and the topography of the beach, an outgoing tide could leave a beached airplane stranded far from the water. An important skill for any sea pilot is to be able to determine the sea conditions by looking at them. Now, that's a bit difficult in flight sim, however. Remember, the size of waves is determined by wind speed, but only in Prepare 3D does that really matter. Other sims use a flat 2D texture for water effects. Uh, we will go over this in more detail later, but for now, know that all this talk of wind and waves really only applies to P3D. Other sims, I'll present you with this table which covers wind speed and associated sea conditions. For those using FSX, I've added a Rex 4 texture column which shows you the Rex 4 texture direct texture that you can use to get a look similar to the one described. Now let's cover some navigation aids. Seaplane pilots have some extra navigation aids to be familiar with. This is in addition to the normal aviation nav aids, and they can be somewhat different compared to the normal land-based airplane counterparts. First, the rotating beacon. Land-based airports use rotating beacons to identify them at night and to aid and reduce visibility. Seaplane bases have this too, however, it flashes an alternating white and yellow as opposed to land-based airports white and green. Double white flashes with a yellow flash indicate a military seaplane base. On navigation charts, seaplane landing areas are depicted with similar symbols as land-based airports, however, an anchor is placed in the center. 
Tick marks indicate the presence of fuel services at the seaplane base, and double ring identifies a military facility. This symbol system is repeated on your aircraft's GPS. Seaplane bases will show up there too. Buoys are floating markers fixed to a chain that anchors them to the bottom. Day beacons are markers placed on top of a pole or piling and are used in shallow water. Buoys and day beacons are marked on nautical charts. With buoys, one should keep in mind that they are attached to the bottom via a long chain. The chain is likely to be several times longer than the depth of the water. Because of this, you should avoid getting too close to buoys as they may be some distance from their charted location and the hazard they mark. Buoys follow a system where their color, shape, number, lights, they all have a specific meaning. Their primary purpose is to guide ships through preferred channels to and from the open sea. In this context, their markings become meaningful. The two primary ones to know about are the keep left and keep right buoys. When approaching from the seaward side, i.e. moving towards the dock or land with the sea to your back, a red buoy means keep left, i.e. keep left of the buoy, and a green buoy means to keep right of the buoy. Buoys can also mark hazards, obstructions, channels, or protected areas of the water, but their meaning stays the same. Day beacons serve the same purpose as buoys, they are just used in place of buoys in shallow water. Though less frequently used these days, lighthouses are useful things to know about too. Lighthouses mark dangerous hazards such as shoals or reefs, and they are also used to mark entrances to harbors. They make useful navigation waypoints for both marine vessels and aircraft, useful on the water and in the air as lighthouses are often unique looking structures that can be picked out from other buildings rather easily. These are often used as waypoints for VFR aircraft. They can be marked on aviation charts, such as this one on Hilton Head Island. This lighthouse is marked on the local sectional chart and used as a waypoint for the charted visual approach to a nearby airport. This particular lighthouse marks the entrance to Harbortown Yacht Basin. Most lighthouses still in use today are unmanned, and in the U.S. many are owned by local governments or nonprofit organizations, though the U.S. Coast Guard still maintains the lights on many of them. Even in today's modern world of GPS and electronic navigation, lighthouses, like charts, are still a useful tool in any navigator's toolbox. Before we end the video, let's go back to buoys real quick. Earlier, I only mentioned buoys that pertain to lateral guidance, i.e. along a channel or something like that. The keep left, keep right buoys. But there are others. Buoys can often be used for weather monitoring and data collecting, as well as marking other things. A yellow buoy with an anchor marks an area where a vessel can drop anchor for some time. A yellow buoy with no marking indicates a caution area. It may be a firing range, underwater hazard, race course, seaplane base, or an area with no through channel. White buoys relay information to vessel operators. White with an orange circle is a speed limit. White with an orange diamond marks a hazard. White with an orange square relays information like the location of a dock or campsite. And white with an orange diamond and crosshair show a restricted area. Mooring buoys are white cylinders or floats with orange tops. They are used to secure a vessel in place. These are the only types of buoys you can moor to, by the way. A simple white cylinder is a buoy that marks an area with swimmer activity. Typically, these are found in lakes or other public areas with a mix of water traffic. They are usually connected to each other with ropes to signal the swimmers to remain in that area, and typically they're found close to shore too. Cardinal buoys are various combinations of yellow and black, and they are used to show the safest water locations relative to the buoys, i.e. A north cardinal buoy indicates safe water to the north. Fairway buoys are white and red, and they mark landfalls, channel entrances, channel centers, and they should be kept to the port side of your craft when passing. Port side is to the left, by the way. A red and black buoy indicates an isolated danger that has navigable water passing through it. And that concludes buoys and this video. Hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you next time.